recording. All right, so the recording has begun. The adventure begins. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Richard, who's going to be presenting for us today. Again, please feel free to put any uh, questions or comments in the chat as Richard is presenting. And I'll go ahead and turn it over now. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and tell people I'm leaving my video off for now, not that you need to see my head, uh, just to make sure that my slideshow actually um, hopefully doesn't do anything weird. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up and get my notes up and get started. Okay, hopefully that shows for everybody. Um, so I'm going to go be talking um, about the upcoming digital partners grants that the library does um, every year um, on campus, the, um, what they are, what we're actually starting to work on right now, and some examples of what we've done in the past so you have some context. So to start, what is a digital partners grant? So the digital partners grant is it's an annual uh, application process um, within the university libraries to basically for um, researchers on campus um, we're promising up to $22,500 worth of university libraries resources um, to help meet their digital scholarship needs and of course digital scholarship can be very broadly defined um, I will point out a financial reward. Um, it is pretty well when I say resources, I'm talking about the time and effort of um, experts within the libraries. Um, most often thus far, these do tend to be resources within ERIT, um, within that unit, usually either my group or David Gwynn's group tend to be heavily involved. But what that really depends on the needs of the applicant uh, and the uh, and other departments or individuals have been involved as we've gone along and I'm, I'll be sure to mention some of these people as we go through. Um, we provide our current hosting environment, our existing hardware and software. We, again, we're it's not an, a cash award, so we're not making any purchases on behalf of faculty and we're not taking any sort of um, you know, lead in that level. Um, we do also promise to keep everything up and running, keep it upgraded, and migrate to new systems as needed. So we're promising a perpetuity hosting, if it's a, again, if it's an IT related project, um, as long as we can. So I'm trying to go to the next slide. This is what I was worried about. But it went forward like three slides. So what's our selection process? Um, I'll point out at the beginning. Um, so these are the three numbered things are basically what we start with when we're trying to select a project. So it should build on the strengths of our current digital or digitized projects. Um, we do look to see if they are, do they align with the digital projects priorities team? Uh, and can we look at these projects as something that develops a library of resources as opposed to doing something that's very one-off? Are we doing something we can reuse? Are we doing something that may be applicable to a larger audience? So it's very much something that is scholarship focused, not classroom focused. So again, we are talking about researchers on campus and their scholarly output not necessarily going into their classroom and helping them with some class work or some classroom technologies. That's not really the focus of this work. Um, and of course, we also look at um, potential future project growth, which might mean working with a researcher to expand the project that we have in some way. It might mean taking it in a new direction, or it might mean using this project as a seed grant or a seed project to work with the researchers on campus on a larger grant project um, and I'll talk about some of that later as well. So what's the process for applying for one of these grants? Um, we have a simple one page online form. Um, generally we work with the deadline being around January 31st with a decision made by end of March and we let everyone know yes or no at that point. The process begins with me so anytime someone applies the form comes to me and then I will either, if it's something that directly involves me, start the work to talk with people, or what normally happens is I'll look at it. The researcher will want to have 
a conversation with me or I will look and I will see, excuse me, that there are other people who might be um, more directly involved or should take the lead on this, or it might not be something that involves me at all. At which point we start having discussions with others in the libraries um, and if appropriate or needed. At that point, I'll probably start also pulling in the um, digital research and scholarship services a committee that I chair um, and get them involved as well as we talk through what projects make sense, who are the appropriate people to be involved, and how to get the right people involved if this is a pro project we'd like to take on. Uh, from that point, once we know who should be involved with the projects, we then start having conversations with the applicants and then based upon if the people the appropriate people in the libraries think it's a project that they could assist with, they have the time to take on, and everyone in their unit's okay with that, then we'll start moving forward with potentially awarding the project. Um, if there's anything like we say we had eight projects and we know we can only do three or four, if some years we've only done one, quite frankly, um, DRSS, again, um, Digital Research Scholarship Services Committee are the ones that sit down, make the decisions on what these final projects are. If it reaches a point where we need to make a decision, sometimes we do all of the projects because we maybe get two applications. Sometimes we have gotten eight or 12 before. How do you choose? Um, so some of the common challenges that we've run into in working on this, um, some projects just, you know, even once we award it, we're not necessarily the uh, priority of the researchers themselves. Uh, they're teaching classes. They have larger research, scale research projects they're working on. We have had projects that the researchers themselves just would not follow up on. It didn't fit into their time frame, or they just um, had other priorities that came up. Uh, we also, which probably does not surprise anyone from ERIT and other units that are in here, we often would have scope creep, wherein you know, we may have a, a researcher on campus who thinks they know what they want, but it may not actually be what they're looking for once we start talking to them. And that's great and we catch it there, but it, it is, there is potential for once someone sees what that we have produced exactly or are in the project of producing the results that exactly what they asked for, they start realizing that's not actually the case, which is why it's also important to bring those um, area and content experts within the libraries into these conversations as far as possible to try to avoid that. Um, and because I'm in IT, I always have to mention that with any project, there's always a maintenance cost. There's not a, a project that we take on that we then say it's finished, we walk away and we never touch it again. Um, anytime we take on a new project, um, it, it's, it's be suddenly becomes it's an ongoing project at that point. There's always a maintenance cost with our work. Um, and then another final challenge that I'll mention is that um, research doesn't always happen on a schedule. So because we have a deadline on January 31st and then we let people know in March, that window doesn't necess isn't necessarily appropriate for a researcher who might have their project and need something that's due in September or October. So while we do have these deadlines, we have to be flexible in order to actually sort of work with the campus as a whole and you know the needs of the different people that we are going to be working with. So if you'd like some more details, well broadly, this looks like it's an end of the presentation slide, but it's not. If you'd like more details and looking at what the actual digital projects grants are in the process, um, the top libresearch.uncg.edu URL goes to the DRSS website. Um, underneath that is broadly the link to the digital research support efforts within the university libraries. And within that will be a link to digital partners grants in the application process. So before we get into the new projects, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some examples because if I'm talking about new projects, there's not much really to show and talk about. We're starting work on them. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about what the actual, some completed projects are that we have done. Um, so in starting with example projects, I just wanted to um, point out some, when we're talking to people about example projects, the list you see on your screen are some of the broad, these are the sorts of things we do or have done or can do for you. And I won't go through each one of them. 
Um, but you see there is a broad variety of things that we have worked with people on and that we say we can't work with people on. So it's a broad scope, I guess is really what I'm saying. Okay. So again, it's bumped through. So if we're talking about some example projects, I just selected four over the past few years um, to talk about. Um, the first one is going to be the Ann Finch Digital Archive, and I'll have images with links to all of these on the slide after this, which you may have seen creep by. Um, the first one is the Ann Finch Digital Archive. Um, this was brought to us by Dr. Jennifer Keith in the English department. And the primary people within the University of Libraries who've worked on it are myself and Vanessa, who reports to me. So the Anfinch Digital Archive is an open access resource that uh, complements the two volume print edition that actually is now out from Cambridge University Press called the Cambridge Edition of the works of Anne Finch um, that Dr. Keith worked on. Um, she was a co-editor and author, I believe. Uh, what we did with the, the arch initial archive was that we put up detailed information about selected poems by Finch and we allow users to explore print and manuscript witnesses oral readings of the poems and more. It was very much, because this is, we worked on this project several years ago, it was very much supplemental to the book. It's the way to lead people to the book, um, although there was some dynamic work in it as well. She was really happy, fortunately, with our work, so it's also led to more ongoing projects with her. So we've been working with her to get some um, audio recordings online of people working with Finch's um, poetry, some musical pieces. And Vanessa is currently working on a project with Dr. Um, Keith, sorry to say Dr. Finch, uh, with Dr. Keith um, creating an online interactive subject index for the free volume print edition. So for example, someone could put in the word healthcare, um, and then we'll be, a, we have the entire text of the three volumes on a server right now in a database, and we can return whatever pages in the volumes that the term healthcare is on. We're not bringing the entire book up, but we are showing people as a beginning point where these words are actually appear in the text. And once we have this sort of thing, and we actually have this in testing now for Dr. Keith, um, there's a lot more we can do with this. This is the beginning point. So the second project I was going to use as an example is I Wish to Say. This was a project with Professor Cheryl Oring in the art department, and it was myself, um, Lee Canada, and David Gwynn all worked on this project. Um, this was a, a, a searchable web-based archive of her ongoing public art project titled, of course, I Wish to Say. It consists of dictated postcards to the U.S. president, and this extended back to, at the very least, through um, Bush II, um, perhaps earlier, and it includes more than 2,000 postcards and supplemental photographs created during her um, art performances because she dressed in like 1950s secretary garb and that sort of thing. Um, you can see pictures on their website. Um, she had these in dozens of states over numerous years. Um, and we completed that project. It was in Content DM at the time. We're now actually currently migrating it over to Omeka as a part of our larger Alindora migration. Um, so it's an example of one of those projects where we are committing to keep this project vibrant and alive and moving forward. The um, third one I was going to mention as an example is the Oaks of the Southeast United States project. Um, this is a project with myself, again with Lee, and um, Dr. Bruce Kirchhoff in the biology department. Um, Dr. Kirchhoff worked with a, um, his, one of his MS students to create an online identification guide to Oaks of the South Sea in the United States. It's very much like a choose your own adventure. You pick a leaf and it starts zooming down and narrowing and narrowing to the point where you can identify the leaf through this visual process. Um, it's the first online guide of its kind in England, the world. And is one of the graduate, the student won the Graduate School's 2015 Award for Innovative Use of Technology on this project. Uh, it is also now featured on the USDA's website on plants.usda.org. Um, we provide a permanent home to the final version of the project and have provided functionality and design updates to the tool. So we did some rebuilding on it to make it a more interactive web-based solution. 
Um, and the final example project that I have on here is has no fancy name. It's just called a paleontology map, paleoanthropology map. Um, this is a project that me and Danny Nanez worked on with Dr. Charles Eglin in the anthropology department. So what this really is, is a web-based mapping application that um, pulls together multi-layered data on archeological digs, focusing on the Bronze Age. Uh, the concern from Dr. Eglin was that given the rapidly accumulating data sets that are being produced, it becomes very difficult to manage, particularly in a field like his, where it's often multidisciplinary, often with each siloed people and disciplines doing the work. So he felt that there was a lacking in paleoanthropology of an easily accessible medium where these vast amounts of data and information can be updated, visually interpreted, and conceptualized in a spatial context. Enter our work with mapping with Esri Maps and Google Maps. So what we did was we took what he wanted and created a web-based mapping application, including an administrative tool based on our existing mapping frameworks. And they are now still using the tool. He has students who are continuing to put more data into it. And he's looking at um, applying for grants to actually start expanding this tool into something much larger. Um, this project has also led to an ongoing collaborative relationship with Dr. Eglin that I'll talk about in a second. So um, I know there probably isn't time to actually look at these, but I did include links to the, the websites themselves. There's an asterisk up here beside I wish to say simply because we are in the process of moving this project and we hope to have that by the end of the summer in its new home in Omaka. Um, everything else on here is, is our solid URLs. So next I was gonna start talking about the four projects that we have accepted as 2020 to 2021 digital partners grants. I'm going to start with this one, uh, the Magdalenian Social Network Analysis Project, which is for me personally a mouthful. This is a project with the aforementioned Dr. Charles Eglin, pictured on the lower left over there, um, in anthropology, myself and David. Um, so Dr. Eglin and a colleague in computer science have applied for an NSF grant to do their work developing a social network analysis approach to the reconstruction of Magdalenian social landscapes. So I'm gonna dive into, this is gonna be a quote from him about what his project actually is because we're in the starting phases of this and I'm not qualified as yet to talk about his project. So the Magdalenian of Western Europe witnessed the creation and circulation of an unprecedented abundance and diversity of portable artwork. The chronological and geographic distribution of these items hints at extraordinarily rich intra and inter-regional social interactions. We seek to develop a social network analysis approach to reconstruction of these Magdalenian social landscapes through the collection of high quality images, the construction of an image processing algorithm, and the use of an online platform that can visually and quantitatively describe the structure of Magdalenian social space. So what in they're really doing is taking or hoping to do is to take these different disks of artwork and by using um, an algorithm and machine learning, can they actually start looking at these and start to trace social networks throughout a culture? So what have we promised? So what I was talking about is an NSF grant application that they have out. So they came to us earlier because they needed work on writing a data management plan for the project. And so our sole commitment for the Digital Partners Grant was to do that. And we have done that. So this is, from that end, this is a project we have actually already finished. So check this one off. But because Dr. Eglin successfully worked with us before, he appreciated the work that we did with him on the data management plan. We've now been written into the actual NSF grant application and assuming it gets successful funding, we'll be providing um, for, we'll be providing for the hosting of the image data that will be generated through the machine learning algorithm. So we'll be actually hosting the research data itself should they get funding. Pretty cool. The next project I'll talk about is the Inglorious Lobster, which absolutely has the best title for a project ever. 
Um, we'll be working with Dr. Karen Kilcup in English, and as you can see, um, your host, Jenny Dale, Maggie, myself, and David are all working on this project. So the Envious Lobster will include stories, poems, and natural history selections on such topics as where ocean-going birds rest, how the sun never sets during a Lapland summer, and why wild animals should not be caged. Fostering innovative scholarship and teaching, the project will assemble a searchable, annotated, open access anthology of the best nature writing and environmental writing published in children's magazines during the 19th century, supplemented by introductions for scholars and teachers. Additionally, it will make widely available the powerful images that often accompany these selections. These compelling and engaging materials are currently only available through institution-supported, password-protected online databases. So that's a, a long way of saying that she wants to create an open access online publication. Um, it's going to be a combination of pulling together some of her scholarship and working with one of her classes um, to start filling this out as a full editorial board run online publication. We looked at um, different online tools such as Scalar to make this work. Um, and some other tools, but what we actually have landed on thus far though is it was important to her to be able to get this initial one up and running quickly so the students can worry more about starting to gather the content. So we're starting with doing it in WordPress and our commitment is going to be doing the WordPress hosting and training, which is honestly not something we would normally do because ITS actually runs WordPress and we really don't like duplicating these functions. But as there's some thoughts towards actually migrating this to a online platform eventually that truly is intended for online publications, we ju it would just be easier than we have direct access to be able to migrate this at some point to this other platform in a much more seamless way. Um, so we do see this as an ongoing project that will into the foreseeable future. So the final two projects, are um, interesting. They are different and unrelated to one another in that different people brought them to us, but they are both coincidentally have a lot of similarities. So before I get into them, I was just going to talk about the similarities in one big shot so I don't repeat myself and I can fly through. So it's two different projects. Both are related to documentary filmmakers um, putting together work related to the civil rights movement. Both are coming from the Media Studies Department. Both are based on, again, documentary filmmaking efforts of potential national impact. And they came to the university libraries because through seeing the Well-Crafted NC project, they started realizing that not only their final documentary film is important, or films for some of them, the actual original data itself in this case, raw video footage is important to keep and make available to the public. So their ask, broadly speaking, was we would like a quote unquote well-crafted like website to host access to our archival research. Um, we're both, both of these, they're also coming to us saying these could be seed grants for larger granting opportunities in the future. So both of these projects sort of have all of this kind of working in the background towards them. Um, so the first project, once the slide moves, is the Richmond Recollection Project. This is a project run by Janita Chase and Hassan Pitts in Media Studies, and they are working with um, Aaron, David, and myself on this. So the Richmond Recollection Project is the beginning of what they hope will be a larger recollection project. It's a socially engaged digital humanities endeavor centered on oral history collections housed in several public placing platforms. The theme of the project is civil rights memory and the first iteration of the project, as I said, is based in Richmond, Virginia. Platforms include a traditional oral history collection, an interactive map with 360 degree video highlighting spaces holding specific memories and a short episodic docu-series. So that's a lot. And they've been having some challenges getting everything going and because they have this expansive idea about what they wanted to do. So in their initial conversations with us, we are actually were talking to them about let's just pull back. Let's focus on getting these original materials up, 
let's get that quote unquote well drafted like web presence done and once you have your materials and they're up then you could start moving forward in a logical way and expanding into a 360 video an interactive map or these other things as projects unto themselves with the archival materials being the centerpiece that the you know that everything the hub everything is spoken out of so you get the materials up and then you let that content lead the direction of the project going forward so our commitment is a hosting of the oral history videos um, we're doing a lot of consultation with them met with them yesterday actually uh, creation of a documentation documentation website modeled on well crafted nc and then do some training on tools such as ohms with them about how they can better give access to their videos and their recordings and if any of you are at the digital humanities institute that um, drss under the leadership of maggie hosted um, they actually presented about their work there so the second project um, of the of the two that are related to civil rights is unsung heroes um, this is actually a project that has um, numerous faculty members from multiple institutions working on it um, but the applicant for the grant was matt barry media studies um, again wanting to work with the three of us so the unsung heroes project is a collecting visual histories of people who stood beside civil rights leaders um, from the 50s 60s and 70s um, so and then quoting from matt you know while these while the names of these unsung heroes are less familiar their stories and recollections represent the pervasive courage and strength of the thousands of people who struggle for equality um, and he sees these as being videos across the South, the Midwest, the West Coast, the Midwest, et cetera. Um, this is going to be a growth and a continuation of a uh, spring 2018 Carnegie Mellon grant for the Unsung Heroes Project. Um, it was a part, it was a part of the uh, Engaging the Humanities, uh, Transforming, excuse me, the Humanities at a Minority Serving Institution grant. And the three of us, Aaron, myself, and David representing University Libraries on that grant. So what's our commitment to this project? Our commitment to this project currently is the hosting of the oral history videos, um, some of which will actually have to be transferring from film, some of which is already recorded in 4K. So there's, some, there's a hosting cost here. Um, we're going to be creating the documentation website, Model on Well-Crafted NC, and the, the screenshot you see there is from that website that I'm currently working on. Um, and we're going to be, digi again, as I mentioned, digitization of analog materials and interviews. And we'll be training and working with students on tools such as OWNS. This is actually very much a seed project for future funding opportunities. This isn't the first time that this project has received funding. It's planned as a national project that will span six decades of history from 1960 to 1980 in its initial phase. And they're hoping in the future to start working forward from 1980 to the present. Uh, the actual image we're using with permission is from Bennett College and it's Bennett Bell's participating in the Greensboro sit-in movement. So it's a shot from downtown Greensboro. And that's it. Nice and fast. Um, it's a lot gone over quickly, I believe. But if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to um, sit and chat and discuss them. Awesome. Start. Thank you so yeah. much, Richard, for doing that. Um, we haven't had any questions come up in the chat yet, but this is a great time for people to ask them if they have them. Sarah says, so cool. Not a question, but a comment. I like good comments. Positive um, let me ask you, do you have a personal favorite of these that you've worked on before? Oh, wow. I've never really thought about as personal favorites. I think, I think I don't really have a specific personal favorite. I think, I think the thing that I get passionate about in working with them are, um, you know, working with the beginnings of the project, working as a partner with various people in various disciplines and, coming together on an idea of how their original idea could become something bigger and larger and different. 
so it's a it's a really an opportunity to um, really sit and, and as a team stretch our brains, and I really I really enjoy that. Um, so I, to me, it's a very much about just creating those relationships and really looking at wow, can we have this as a beginning? The whole point of this project is of the digital partners grants are there beginnings of something bigger and to sit there and say this could go somewhere that neither of us independent would have ever thought of and look what we're doing now um, that's really a lot of the where i get the passion out of this as opposed to you know the, the ones from the english department kind of excite me because i have a degree in english same with art because that's where my degree is so i, I enjoy both of those but you know the idea like the idea of working on an anthropology computer science one that's creating social networks based on algorithms of how the art was created on these discs is just like, to me, it's like a little mind, mind boggling. Um, I, just, I love it. So they're all your favorites. They're, like they're, they're, they're all my favorites. Yeah. They're, I mean, <laughs> and, and there's such a variety of, you know, on a good year, especially there's such a variety of things. Um, I mean, just look at the four we're talking about now. We have the two civil rights ones, which is like this amazing serendipity, right? Like there's different projects with so much in common, but then there's, you know, a simple data, you know, data management plan project that could become this massive NSF grant. I mean, and then of course, like I said, the English one, the Glorious Lobster, I mean, that's just great, right? So that one's going to be fun. I agree. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And it's one, you know, you know speaking with you about this, where there's so much opportunity for, for partnerships and collaboration doing these things. Um, and invariably at some point I'm thrown in over my head and I'm like, you know, I don't even understand what X person is asking for. And that's when I will, I will immediately start running around trying to find the right person to talk to. It, it's, it's, yeah. And it, it, it's a new way for people to think about what we do in the libraries as well. All right. So it's fun. That's awesome. All right, Thank we have a question from Marilyn in the chat. Where does the fund okay. the projects come from and the ongoing funding to continue hosting sites? Uh, I missed the first part of that, I'm sorry. Sorry, where does the funding for the projects come from and the ongoing funding to continue hosting sites? Well, the funding at the beginning, like I, I said at the outset, there's no award in this. So it's very much, I could go into the history because this is, Doing this sort of thing is something I've been, I've been working on trying to do for probably close to 10 years now, to be honest. But it's always been very much a, um, those of you who have been here for a while will remember that at one point around 2008, 2009, when the recession came, we were looking at hiring specifically a full-time person who would be doing the work I'm talking about, but the recession came and you know, this is, this is our direction forward. So it's very much an, an, carved out amount of time and resources that we already have there's no actual awards and you know as with all things not to speak for franklin but as with all things any project since i, I assume when you're asking about these things you're talking about yes and the recession is here again exactly um as any it project no matter how small or large because i'll just talk about it I'll, I, will, I will defer to maggie and jenny to talk about anything that might be roi -ish, but with any IT project from the smallest to the largest, there's a cost. And that's a matter of honestly prioritization of within the libraries, right? It, how do you do it? Where is it? Um, but to be honest, for the most part, these are seed projects. So if we're talking about, do we need to buy a new server just as a, for example, um, they're never really that you know, intensive, if that makes sense. The, um, the real cost, again, when I talk about maintenance is much more on time, you know, we have to keep working on them. As soon as we see something that's going to be a cost to the libraries that, you know, a true, it will cost us X money to do this. Um, it becomes a larger conversation that usually is let's back this up. Kind of like what I said about the Richmond recollection project. Let's back this up. What's the core of the project? Let's work on this as a seed, and then you we apply for grants to say, well, we need X terabytes of hosting for this. Franklin, how much does that cost? And we write it into grants. So we we do we cover additional costs through grant writing, to be honest, and as much as we can. 
is that that's a helpful answer. Without going into years of history of how we got to this point, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer in some ways. Is that cool, Marilyn? Right. So, the, so the, the funding is really, like, you, like you're saying, kind of carving out people's time. Yeah, it's very much primarily a carving out of time and, uh, and the understanding from people. Yeah, exactly, in kind, exactly. So it's very much yeah, carving out time for people like, do I have time in the coming year with all of my projects to work on this? And that's one of the reasons it's important to bring in people from around the library. So I can't just go to Jenny, for example, and say, I've got X project. You need to work on it. Jenny very much, is it in her, does she have the time to devote with this? Is it a part of her work? Is it, um, you know, does Amy approve of it? Yeah. So Marilyn responded that she was just hoping that the economic situation didn't steal from the projects. So hopefully uh, it doesn't happen, but it, 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 it should not. Um, I'll tell you the one that, the one that, um, the only one that concern has been expressed about is actually the inglorious lobster. And that was Dr. Kilcup who knowing me about it. Concern because, you know, what if her classes are online and that, that sort of, that sort of thing. But to be honest, I mean, the work, the work is, as it is right now, creating a WordPress site and training them on how to do that. Well, from my perspective, I mean, again, not speaking for Jenny or Maggie, who are also involved with that project, you know, once you've trained them on it, and sure, that might not be in person, that might be virtual. The project itself gets to go forward. Um, I'll, I'll say, I'll go ahead and say, you know, both of the civil rights related projects are active right now. Um, I'm myself and others are currently, you know, like I said, we had a meeting with Janeta and Natan yesterday, multiple meetings with Matt Barr about his project. As of right now, you know, they're moving forward. And I really don't think in the near future, the current economic climate will affect these projects. Going forward, you know, will we do these next year? You know, that, that's, that's a question we have every year, honestly. Um, and we always have to review. There have been years where the various people in the library were so there was a lot happening and we kind of knew we weren't be able to do it unless it was a small one-off. So it varies year to year, but I don't think these projects are going to have an issue, I guess is the short answer. Awesome. All right. Any other questions from our audience today? And if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, that is totally fine. You can also use the chat however you want to do it. I'll just add to, um, what Richard said. Um, I'll just add uh, a little bit to what Richard said about uh, at least on the, the server and storage side of things. Fortunately, the library the past two years has invested pretty um, heavily in our uh, infrastructure network. So at least for a couple of years, we should be in pretty good shape. Now, out beyond a couple of years, uh, get back to me then. So, <laughs> but but on the server side of things, we we should be uh, in in good shape for for a little while. Yeah. There 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 are just to add up, build on. Franklin and I tend to bounce off each other a lot when we talk. Um, there there were a couple of projects that came through that were potentially going to be digital partners grants, but they were too big, and we were like, well, there needs to be funding happening for these, and so they've gone in other directions. Yeah, and as Richard mentioned in, in part of his presentation, uh, there have been times when we've gotten written into larger grants and we've gotten funding for, um, you know, infrastructure components of the, of the um, projects through external grants, you know, for, for things like, like storage and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, so some of our ongoing costs get offset that way. The other kind of nice thing, uh, at least on the server and storage side of of things is as, as technology expands and improves and gets better, storage costs actually keep going down. So, you know, a, a good example of that, if you think about, you know, 10 years ago, if you were talking about buying several gigabytes of storage, you were talking a fairly significant cost. Whereas now, when we start talking significant costs, we're starting to talk terabytes of storage. 
So, you know, that, that helps us with sort of these ongoing costs of maintaining um, these things. And, you know, hopefully that, uh, that trend will continue and we'll be able to you know, keep these things up and going in perpetuity. Because um, a lot of them are really great things and we don't want to see them go away ever. Yeah. Thank you, Franklin. All right, last call for questions before I stop the recording and we wrap this up. Maggie, do you have a question? No, I don't have a question. I was waiting for you to stop the recording so that I can <laughs> say can that it. I was just trying out my Skyrim Zoom background uh, and it looks great. <laughs> Um, but now that's recorded for all time. And everyone will agree with you. All right, folks. Well, yes, thank you, Maggie, for sharing. I will go ahead and stop the recording.